certainly a uh, very interesting time to have this talk. In fact, Donald Trump's going to be here tomorrow, not here, but in Kirtland Hills, doing a fundraiser. Um, so Ohio's a very, very important state, and he's doing one uh, tomorrow downtown Cleveland as well. So we'd like to thank you guys for sharing some of your valuable time with us. Congratulate you on you making an investment in your future. As I say, this has been a very, very interesting and unconventional election thus far. But I think it's easy to forget that beyond the presidential election, there are a lot of other races and issues uh, that are happening and that people tend to forget about some of the you know, congressional races, Senate, and some of the redistricting and that, that sort of thing. But regardless, I think it's critical to understand, and if you've heard me speak, we've talked about this for 30 years, that the media is going to focus on the negative in the short term. And with the increased competition for viewers and listeners and readers, the mainstream media uses drama, fear, and negativity to get people to tune in. The other thing you're seeing is more partisanship. I mean, you can pretty much pick your channel and pick your party um, at this point, which is a little bit different. Now, one of the things that has been consistent as long as we've done this and we've watched elections is that investors Doubts and concerns seem especially prevalent during presidential election years because the campaign spotlight some of the challenges we're facing and election year rhetoric certainly amplifies uh, what is negative. And so, you know, one of the things that we feel a trusted advisor can do is help navigate the sea of information uh, or misinformation and remain focused on a longer term plan that makes sense in the context of what you're trying to achieve. The role of the advisor is not so much to select investments or you know, try to guess what the market's going to do, because frankly, nobody really knows. Uh, but it's more to help you develop, enact, monitor, and then update a plan as your goals and visions change. And basically sort through all the information to figure out what's relevant to you and then what's, what's just noise. Beyond helping you develop a plan, I think the other thing is that the advisor can help you avoid making poor decisions based on fear or emotion rather than facts, and things move very, very quickly. You know, if you look after the Brexit announcement, which was on a Friday, that weekend there was breaking news all weekend about how the global economy was going to collapse as the EU fell apart. A week later, our markets hit new highs. And so, you know, what the market does week to week or month to month or every six months, what your portfolio does, frankly, it's unimportant. You know, the key is being able to meet your needs and being able to do what you want to do um, in a manner that's consistent with your risk risk tolerance. You know, and, and you know, if the market changes dramatically tomorrow, is your life going to change at all? And frankly, the answer is no, you know, as long as you've planned. It's kind of like if your house, if you appraised your house every week, you know, and all of a sudden, one week, the neighbor's house gets foreclosed, so your house is worth 30% less. And then the next week, it's worth 30% more. Doesn't matter. No, you're living in the house, you're not selling it. And frankly, the value is kind of subjective anyway. But your house is only worth what somebody would pay you for it. So, you know, I think it's important to understand because people focus on these, these short-term swings, and frankly, that they're irrelevant. But there are three reasons that we would recommend changes but changes to the market are not one of them. Now, the reasons we're going to recommend you change something are one, something changes with you. <clears throat> your needs change, your vision changes. Two, there's an issue with an individual investment within the portfolio. Or three, the overall asset allocation doesn't make sense anymore. Maybe it's too aggressive, maybe something went up. But, but regardless, what we see, and we think we're going to see more volatility as we get closer to the election. We think once the election happens, things should stabilize a little bit. And in the near term, it doesn't matter who gets elected. Long term, it absolutely does. But near term, markets hate uncertainty. They can assimilate bad news, but they don't like uncertainty. And right now, we have a lot of uncertainty. And I'd suggest once you get someone elected, at least we know where we're going. Whether you like it or not, you know, at least we know where the four-year ride's going to be. And so that's going to create a little bit of stability. Now, we've developed and refined 
a process for what we call personal vision planning, which takes a holistic approach to trying to achieve your personal goals. And we believe in a proactive methodology that takes into consideration the type of volatility we're seeing now and we expect in the future. So understanding what your personal vision is is key to being successful in doing that. And that's why periodic reviews and speaking with you is important. But events like this can really supplement those types of things as we hopefully provide you know, some broader knowledge and insight and perhaps you hear questions from other people they might not have thought of. And I think that's one of the values of this. Now, since 1987, and I've known some of you since 1987, um, you know, our mission's been to help clients simplify their lives while enhancing their lifestyle. And a lot's changed. I mean, the internet didn't exist, for one thing. Um, the media, you know, back then there was basically three stations, NBC, CBS, ABC. CNN didn't exist at that time. Um, but our core value of making people's lives better has always been consistent regardless of those changes. And we've undertaken a number of philanthropic efforts to build what we call social capital. In 2013, we started a new initiative that I just want to take one minute to, to tell you about, something called Carver Cares. The goal was to try to raise awareness about local nonprofits in our community to benefit all of us, to help support them a little bit, but primarily to, to raise awareness of what they're doing and what they add to the community. The partner tonight is Crossroads and New Directions. There's some information on the tables. Their CEO, Mike Mitoni, is here. I mean, he'll be available outside if you have questions <laughs> on what they do. Crossroads, um, for more than 40 years, has been providing a continuum of quality, life-changing behavioral health services uh, to children, adolescents, and young adults, and their families. Um, New Directions uh, serves about 400 people a year. Crossroads serves more than 2,300 children every year. Now, the interesting thing is, you know, if you decide to support them, it's not just a charitable contribution, it's really an investment in the community. For every dollar that, that we invest in education, prevention, treatment, um, we save about $8 in court costs, jail, and those types of things. Anything that people donate tonight, I will match up to $4,000. So the next 30 days, if anyone uh, donates, um, we will match that. No one's ever turned away from either of those organizations uh, for an inability to pay. And certainly government funding and so forth um, continues to, to cut back. You know, to me, the, the role that they play in our community, it's something a lot of us may not even be aware of. Um, but directly or indirectly, it impacts all of us, including you know, things like the value of your home. So I hope you'll at least um, take a look. So, the last thing I would say is it's important when you look at this to understand that both politicians and the media have a vested interest in crisis reporting. If everything was running smoothly, we wouldn't need politicians to fix it. And if everything was perfect, nobody would watch TV, because who, who really cares that the plane landed safely? Yeah, but when one of them wrecks, everybody wants to see that, because that's news. So, you know, since 1987, again, we've worked to inform and educate, and today's program is really a continuation of that effort. In fact, Andy was kind enough to speak for us in 2008, and one of his uh, partners, Jeff Bush, spoke in 2012. So some of you may have heard either one of them. But Andy is one of the nation's most sought after speakers in all political, political legislative developments, and the likely effect um, on the government's tax, fiscal, and retirement policies. Now, according to CNBC, and he is um, Wall Street's tax expert and also one of Washington's savviest political observers. You may have seen Andy on CNBC. You may have uh, read some of his quotes and publications ranging from the Wall Street Journal to USA Today. But um, we have the privilege of hearing Andy tonight he will take some questions afterwards. He'll be around. 
And then as always, if you have questions later, because inevitably you think of that on the way home, you know, please feel free to give us a call, speak to your advisor, and we'd be happy to, uh, to follow up. So with that, I'd like to introduce Andy Friedman. Well, thanks, Randy. Uh, it's, it's a treat. Thank you. Uh, to be back here, uh, there was a little doubt whether I was going to make it on time. Uh, the plane, we had a little problems with planes and crews not showing up. Uh, and then finally, it looked like we were about to leave Washington. We had a lightning storm. Lightning storms are unusual things in Washington because everybody in Congress comes out. They think God is taking their picture when that happens. <laughs> so we had to work our way through that. Uh, but I will say through all that, uh, Randy was very calm. I mean, he didn't worry about a thing. So I'm sure that he handles uh, your questions the same way. It was very impressive, Randy. Not, not, a, not a blip about worry. All right, I want to talk, obviously, about the election. We'll talk about what the challenges each candidate faces, uh, what, who might win in various parts of the election, Senate, uh, House, et cetera. Uh, and then most important, how whoever wins might affect your investments and your taxes and what you're trying to accomplish. But as Randy pointed out, it's a very unusual year this year. We've seen a rise of populism, both on the left with Bernie Sanders and on the right with Donald Trump. And many people are saying, why? Why is this happening now? I'm sure everybody has their own view. But in my view, it comes down to, I think, burgeoning income inequality. That this has been a problem the country has been facing over time. And now it has gotten so severe that it's broken out to cause all this commotion as the elections are going on. If you had money to invest in 2008 after the, uh, the downturn, You've had a 200% return, give or take, on your funds since then. If you did not have money to invest, you're just relying on your wages, your wages have gone up 15% at the same time. So wealth has beget more wealth and has caused the increase in income inequality that we're seeing now. The middle class is no longer the nation's majority. Think about that. That's the first time that's happened. We are no longer the nation's majority for people in the middle class. And if you look at the percent of income earned by the top families in the United States, it's pretty staggering. The top 1% of families by income earns 19% of all income earned in the United States. The top 10% earns 45% of all income in the United States. These are the highest figures we've ever recorded. So that exists. Both parties acknowledge income inequality is a problem. And the question then is, what do you do about it? And that's where we see the divergence that I think is giving rise to the election today. So the typical Democratic view, and I don't mean this pejoratively, the Democratic view is capitalism has hard edges and the government is needed to have programs that smooth some of those edges and help people ascend to the middle class. So from Democrats, you hear things like government paid for education, government jobs or government jobs programs, higher minimum wages, things that let people move up into the middle class. Well, that all costs money. So how do you pay for that? Well, in the Democrats' view, you tax the very people who have had that nice 200% return since 2008. Surely they can afford to help pay more for people who are less fortunate. Republicans' views are quite different. They say we should be focusing on growth, not inequality, and we need to take government off the backs of businesses and individuals so they can grow and they can hire and people can move up into the middle class. So in the Republicans' view is all these regulations that we have seen, EPA regulations, Obamacare, uh, if you're in the financial services, DOL regs, all that's doing is retarding the growth of business. We need to take government off the backs of businesses. On the question of taxation, Republicans say, the wealthy are already, or the affluent, are already overtaxed. And the numbers do perhaps support them. The top 1% of family by wages, by earnings in the US, pay 49% of all taxes paid in the country. Compare that to the 19% of income they're earning. The top 10% pay 82% of all taxes paid compared to 45% of income. 
So that sets up, I think, the income inequality issue that is giving rise to the populism and giving rise to the disparate views we're seeing from Washington. All right, so let's put that behind us and start talking about the election. And at this time, I'm going to be talking about politicians. And you know, it's very hard to predict what politicians are going to do. So as I'm talking now, keep in mind the derivation of the word politics. Poly, meaning many, and ticks, meaning small blood-sucking leech-like parasites. If you keep that in mind, we're going to be fine. All right. We all know that the presidency is up for election this year, but we also have to keep in mind that both the House and the Senate are up as well. So I want to talk about them first. I'll start with the House. In order to understand the House of Representatives, I have to take you back to 2010. Because in 2010, we had a census, and all of the states reset the boundaries of their congressional districts. Now, 2010 was the year Republicans took over the House. That was the rise of the Tea Party. They also took over most of the state legislatures that year. And that wasn't happenstance. They knew there was going to be redistricting, and they wanted to control the process. So in most cases, you had Republican state legislatures setting the boundaries of congressional districts in that state. And guess what? This will shock you now. They drew the lines to make the districts safe for Republicans. Can you believe that? So you get crazy shaped districts with two heads and three legs and tentacles to make that district safe for Republicans. You know, we call this gerrymandering. And then residual districts in that state, maybe in the cities, they'd be safe for Democrats. And if you had a Democratic run state, it wasn't any different. They drew the lines to make the district safe for Democrats and residual districts were safe for Republicans. Now, I'm sure you think I'm exaggerating this. Here are six actual congressional districts that came out of gerrymandering in 2010. Check out, for instance, the one on the lower left. You think they were trying to reach a result there? The result of this is, if you're in the House of Representatives now, you don't worry about winning the election. You're going to win the election because your whole district votes like you do. So all 435 seats in the House up for election. Democrats need to pick up 30 seats to take over the House. In my estimation, only 12 races are what we'd call toss-ups. We don't know who's going to win. So I'll go out on a limb here and tell you that Republicans are going to keep the House. Not just this election, but for the rest of the decade. And frankly, if Republicans continue their stranglehold on state governments, they hold 31 of them now, they'll actually control the House for the next decade when we have gerrymandering in 2020. So this is an important point. No matter who wins the presidency, all legislation has to go through the Republicans in the House. All right, what about the Senate? Well, we all know two years ago, the uh, Republicans took over the Senate. And they were able to do that because in 2014, the numbers favored them. There were 35 seats up for election a couple years ago. 21 were Democrats trying to hang on to their seats. When had those Democrats last been elected? In 2008 on Obama's coattails. Many were running from Republican states. When they came up for re-election, they lost. Republicans took over the Senate. That situation reverses this year. Because when were senators being elected this year last elected? In 2010, which as I said was a big year for Republicans, big backlash against the administration. Most of those Republicans are running from Democratic-leaning states. In fact, five of them are running from states that voted twice for Obama. So we have 34 seats up for election in the Senate. 24 are Republicans trying to hang on to their seats. And if you go state by state, it looks pretty good for the Republicans. There are seven states where they might well pick up seats. We're sitting in one of them. Also Florida, Illinois, Indiana, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. There's one state, Nevada, where Republicans may be able to bite back. But on the numbers, yeah, it looks pretty good for the Democrats taking the Senate. But there's a big difference this time from two years ago, and that is there's a presidential candidate at the top of the ticket. And American voters are splitting their tickets less than they ever have before. So if one of the two candidates engenders a big turnout, a lot of popularity, 
that's going to influence the Senate as well. So my bottom line on the Senate is it will go the same way as the White House. Hillary Clinton wins, we'll have a Democratic Senate. Donald Trump wins, we'll have a Republican Senate. House is going to be Republican regardless. So then let's turn to the presidential election. And before we get into the candidates, I want to throw out three slides of statistics to you. I'm sorry, I know it's late, this is the last thing you want. But you can't understand this election without understanding these metrics, and nobody, to my knowledge, is talking about them. The first is party affiliation. We found out from the Gallup organization earlier this year that the percent of independent voters is at an all-time high for a presidential election. 42% of voters are independent. As you'd expect, of course, percent of registered Republicans and Democrats have come down accordingly. One of the keys to winning this election is capturing that independent vote. I know how Democrats are going to vote, and I know how Republicans are going to vote. What I don't know is how independents are going to vote. Now, I'll paint with a broad brush here and say, I think independents are worried about economic issues. They're worried about jobs. They're worried about taxes. They're worried about spending. They're not so worried about social issues, things like gay marriage or global warming. If you're going to vote based on a particular social issue, you're probably going to belong to the party that has the same view. For independents, it's not as important. So the candidate that can put forward a better, more convincing economic program will probably do better with independence. The second is demographics. Since the last election, the percent of non-white Americans has gone up three percentage points, the highest, of course, that it's ever been. Last presidential election, Mitt Romney got 59% of the white vote. That's a little high, but generally in line with what Republican candidates get. This year, to win the election, if the candidate gets 59% of the white vote, he or she will have to get 30% of the non-white vote to win the election. Now, Romney got 17% of the non-white vote, and that's very much in line with what Republican candidates have received. So the ability to attract minorities, blacks, Latinos, also women, of course, very important in this election. If I flip it and say, okay, what happens if Donald Trump can only hold 17% of the non-white vote? Well, then he'll need 65% of the white vote to win the election. That's only been approached once by Ronald Reagan in his second term. And then finally, and most important, is the Electoral College. To win the presidency, a candidate needs 270 electoral votes. If I add up all the states we know are going to go Democratic, New York, California, the Democrats head into this election with 257 electoral votes, 13 votes shy of winning the presidency. If I do that with the Republicans, they head in with 191 electoral votes, 79 votes shy of winning the presidency. 90 votes still in place, so of course either candidate can still win. If I look at the states that compose that 90 votes still in play, and of course yours is one of them, you realize that Republicans have to run the table on the top four of those states in order to win the election. They have to win Florida, North Carolina, here in Ohio, and Virginia. For Republicans, if Trump loses any one of those states, he will have lost the election. Now, he can do that, sure. You get on a run, you get a big turnout, a lot of people enthusiastic, you can run those four states. But I think it's fair to say on the numbers alone, they strongly favor the Democrats. Democrats have much less far to go to get over the top in the Electoral College. Traditionally, they've done a much better job of uh, of getting the uh, minority vote. And that tells me on the numbers, you have to favor the Democrats. But look, it's not just a numbers game, okay? Personalities matter. So let's talk a little bit about the candidates. And that means we have to start, of course, with Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump is showing me something I never knew. And that is you can insult your way to the presidency of the United States. Who knew that? What's going on with Donald Trump? Well, Donald Trump supporters are typically male. They're typically white. They're typically older. They're typically working class Americans, and they feel that their way of life is under siege, both economically 
and culturally. Their wages, if they still have a job, have barely gone up, as we have seen. And in their view, really nobody has been trying to help them. The Democrats for the last eight years, say Trump supporters, really have been pandering to the very people that are threatening their way of life. Republicans for six years have been going to Washington and saying we're going to stop it, and they haven't done a thing. And so here comes Donald Trump. He's arrogant. He's brash. And he says, I hear you. I hear what you're dealing with. I hear what you have gone through. I hear that nobody has helped you. I am here. I'm here, and I will fix it. And that is a great message for people who feel that their way of life is under siege and nobody is doing anything about it. They also like the fact that Trump has simple answers to questions. He's not one of those politicians that talks on for three paragraphs and never really says anything. His answers are intuitive. If you're worried about immigration, you build a wall on the Mexican border. And while you're at it, you get the Mexican government to pay for the wall. If you're worried about terrorism, you stop Muslims from entering the country. Those are intuitive answers that make sense to people. And when conventional politicians or the media criticizes Trump, that can't be done, that's unconstitutional, whatever. That's not, not, that one doesn't work with the way the U.S. works. That actually helps Trump because his supporters say, well, of course they're saying that. Those are all the politicians that have left us alone for the last eight years, haven't done anything for us. Of course they're criticizing him. He's the one for the answers. So you wrap that all up and you have a very persuasive message for one segment of the U.S. voting population. And that explains, I think, why Trump has done so well. So what are then the obstacles that each candidate has to overcome between now and Election Day in order to win the election? What's each candidate going to have to focus on? Let me start with Clinton because I haven't said much about her. I think Clinton has three challenges she has to overcome to win this election. The first is she is very closely tied to the Obama administration. She wasn't merely Secretary of State. She has embraced the policies of the Obama administration. And at a time when you have a populist uprising saying people in Washington aren't doing anything for us, how does Hillary Clinton present herself as an agent for change? She's a lifetime politician. She's very embedded in Washington. How does she convince voters that she can fix the problems? You're going to hear from Trump, if you didn't do better under eight years of Obama, why are you going to do better under another four years of his administration? That's something that she's going to have to overcome. The second is, many people do not view her as trustworthy. Now, the FBI didn't indict her, but their report was pretty scathing about how she had conducted her affairs. And that fits with many people's view of the Clintons. Many people think there's a lack of transparency there. And she's going to have to overcome that. How is, how is she going to show that she is trustworthy? And finally, a majority of American voters view Clinton unfavorably, and they have for a number of months. It's pretty staggering, since even before the convention, more than 50% of American voters do not view her favorably. That is a very high negative heading into the election. So I'm guessing what? We have one or two Republicans here in the room, is that right? <laughs> And my guess is both of you look at Hillary Clinton and you say, how can she be a viable candidate for president? And all these apparent transgressions, this lack of transparency. And the answer is that as bad as Hillary Clinton's unfavorability numbers are, they pale compared to Donald Trump's. Donald Trump, most recent poll, 70% of voters view Donald Trump unfavorably. And if you start breaking it down, 77% of Hispanics 89%, I'm sorry, 77% of women, 89% of Hispanics, 94% of African Americans, and harking back to my very first slide, two thirds of independents. Those are numbers that are difficult to overcome. That is a very high unfavorability rating heading into the election, the highest we've ever seen from a major party candidate. So look, it would be easy for me to stand here and say, in recent polls, perhaps notwithstanding, Hillary Clinton's going to win. The, per, the numbers, the metrics clearly favor the Democrats. She may be unpopular, but she is far more popular than Donald Trump is. And that says, look, she's going to win. But I'm not prepared to go there yet. 
I'm not prepared to go there yet. I think we have to see how this plays out. And there's a number of reasons why I say that. The first is I mentioned Donald Trump supporters, but I probably didn't explain to you how fervently they support Donald Trump. Here's a quote from one of his supporters. The only way Trump won't get my vote is if he breaks into my house and murders me. <laughs> and that supporter continues, and even then I'll vote for him by absentee ballot. <laughs> now that is a supporter. And there is tremendous enthusiasm among Trump supporters for him. The second is, and again, I don't mean this pejoratively, Donald Trump is not wedded to any particular positions. He's not a true conservative, and that gives him the leeway to change if necessary as we go forward. And just to show you, here's what Trump said a number of months ago. I will be changing very rapidly. I'm very capable of changing to anything I want to change to. Now to show you his capacity for change, here's what Donald Trump said more recently. You think I'm going to change? I'm not going to change. <laughs> so you can see he can change. But the real reason, the real reason I think you cannot dismiss Donald Trump is he has an incredible capacity to control the rules of engagement. Look, in the primaries, Marco Rubio knew what to say when he got on that stage. Jeb Bush knew what to say. Ted Cruz knew what to say. And yet they were knocked back on their heels by Donald Trump's onslaught. They were thrown off and they never could catch up after that. Why is Hillary Clinton going to do any better? Trump's nicknames are fabulously effective. Lion Ted, Little Marco, Low Energy Jeb, Crooked Hillary. Why is it going to be different? All the pundits have been saying he can't go further and he always has. So here's the way that I sum it up. Look, the odds of Trump winning are, are lower. Clinton has a major advantage going into this election just on the numbers and his unpopularity. But I continue to give Trump what I call a puncher's chance of winning this election. You know the Mike Tyson quote, everybody has a plan until they're hit in the face? Well, a puncher's chance means he's against a favorite opponent, but he could wind up with that one punch that sneaks through, throws her off her game, and he goes ahead and wins. I think there are two things you want to watch as we move forward. The first is, and this is crucial, is the first debate on September 26th. If Hillary Clinton can hold her own, unlike what happened with his primary opponents, it's going to be very hard for Trump to win this election. If, on the other hand, he can throw her back on her heels a little bit and she stammers and struggles and looks like she's having difficulty, you might see Trump uh, actually pull this thing out. So I think that is one key. And the second, and I certainly don't have to tell you folks this, is watch the polls in those four states that I mentioned. The national polls don't matter. Those four states matter. If Trump starts getting closing the gap in those four states, yours being one of them, then that means he might have a chance. So, so bottom line, I think Hillary Clinton remains heavily favored, but I, don't think, I do think it's too early to suggest this election is over. Let's see how the debates go and whether Trump can pull another rabbit out of his hat with his unique debating style. Before we go on to what I think will happen after the election, I do want to share with you my favorite quote coming out of the campaign so far. Lord knows there have been a ton of them. But this one comes from Senator Lindsey Graham. Now, those of you with long memories, I don't know, three months, four months, <laughs> you might remember that Lindsey Graham was actually a Republican candidate for president. He is a senator from South Carolina. Uh, he's never been married. He's a lifelong bachelor. And so, of course, when he was running, we heard questions from the press like, well, who would be first lady? What are we going to do about that? I'm telling you, you cannot make this stuff up. <laughs> But here's what Lindsey Graham had to say about Mitt Romney. He said, with Mitt Romney, we tried tall, good looking, smart, nice, great family. We're not going down that road again. <laughs> All right, what happens after the election? Uh, and this is, I think, for us this evening, the most important reason we're here, which is regardless of which candidate wins, what kind of changes are we going to see that are going to affect your investments and your taxes and the way you work with Randy as you're structuring your portfolio? 
I want to talk a bit about what I would expect to see from each administration if they win. We'll again start with Clinton. And I'm going to be focusing here on fiscal issues and taxes. I'm not talking about more social issues and things like that. Because that, the fiscal issues are what affect your investments. To start with, uh, Hillary Clinton is against entitlement reform, meaning that she is not willing to cut Social Security or Medicare benefits, uh, even for people just entering the workforce, for younger people. Tr consistent with the way I set it up at the beginning for income inequality, she holds the typical Democratic view of how to deal with income inequality, which is essentially, and I don't, again, don't mean this pejoratively, a tax and spend type of philosophy. So Hillary Clinton wants to increase significantly federal spending on social programs, programs that will help people move up into the middle class. How will she pay for those? Well, her plan includes a significant tax increase on affluent Americans. Again, the typical Democratic response is what we'd expect. But Hillary Clinton has a Republican House. And there is no way a Republican House is going to agree to more spending on social programs or on higher taxes. It's not going to happen. So I see a Hillary Clinton presidency as a continuation of the gridlock that we have now in Washington. Nothing gets done. No big initiatives get passed. We reach a deadline, say the government has to be funded or it shuts down. At the 11th hour, we get a short-term compromise. The can is kicked down the road for six months or a year, and we go through the whole thing again. Now, as voters and as Americans, you may find that really frustrating. Why can't Washington get anything done here? But as an investor, that might not be a bad thing. Wall Street does not like unpredictability. It likes things to be predictable. And having gridlock in Washington means nothing can come out of Washington that upsets the apple cart. Think back to Obama's first two years when he had a Democratic Congress. We saw Obamacare, we saw Dodd-Frank, we saw unprecedented spending, and all of that happened because we had one party. And Wall Street reacted negatively to that because a lot of those are things that hurt businesses. You get a Hillary Clinton in a Republican House, Maybe that's not so bad for the market. It doesn't have to worry about Washington. It just focuses on things it should focus on, like economics. So that's where I think a Clinton presidency goes. What about a Trump presidency? Well, as I said, markets don't like unpredictability. I can't think of anyone as unpredictable as Donald Trump. I don't know if you remember this. This was a small blip in the radar. But a number of months ago, Trump, based on his bankruptcy experience, said, well, maybe the way we should get out of this fiscal crisis is the U.S. should pay back its debt with a haircut. If you own a Treasury bond, instead of getting 100 cents on the dollar, when you cash it in, maybe you'd get 90 cents. Now, fortunately, he walked back that comment quickly. But of a comment like that from a sitting president, that Treasury bonds cannot be relied upon, I think that would send the markets into a tailspin. So I think that unpredictability alone is a concern. Second, Trump's American first policy includes significant protectionism on trade. Trump believes that we should impose a very high tariff on goods entering the United States that are competing with US businesses, perhaps a 40% tariff on goods entering the country. Our trading partners, like China or Japan, will put their own tariffs on US goods and U.S. exports will plummet. Most economists think that would be a real problem for the economy, that if we couldn't continue to make the kind of exports that we're making. Now, while I believe Trump does want that, I also believe that the Republicans in the House do not. Paul Ryan and the House leadership are very much free trade. They want free flow of goods and services and capital around the world. They don't like trade barriers. So while Trump might want to do this type of protectionism, I don't think it'll get through Congress. So I'm going to put aside that concern. If it were to get through Congress, I think the markets would react negatively, but I don't think it will. I don't think he'll be able to implement that. On the fiscal side, Trump, like Hillary Clinton, and unlike all the other Republican candidates, is against entitlement reform. He does not want to reduce Social Security or Medicare benefits even for younger workers. Now, Trump would not spend more on social programs, 
but he would spend significantly more on the military. In fact, just even on the plane flight out here, I was reading about his latest statement that he wants to remove certain caps that are in place on military spending. He wants a significant more spending on the military, make America's military the finest in the world. Unlike Clinton, Trump, oh yeah, unlike Clinton, Trump would not raise taxes, Trump would reduce taxes. In fact, his tax plan is the typical Republican plan on steroids. The federal government brings in $3 trillion of revenue a year. Donald Trump would cut that by $1 trillion. He would take away a third of all government funding. And unlike Clinton also, Trump has a, a Congress of his party. They'll be only too happy to reduce taxes and increase spending on defense. So the concern with the Trump administration is that we see a growth in the deficit, a growth in borrowing to cover the fact that we're spending more and bringing in less. And it could be that a Trump administration follows the arc of the George W. Bush presidency, that at some point down the road, the debt becomes too much and there has to be a readjustment and that causes some economic hardships. So again, looking just at the, the, the uh, effects of their presidency combining Congress and the White House, I see a Clinton presidency more as a uh, continuation of gridlock, not much gets done, frustrating but probably good for the markets. Trump presidency more unpredictable uh, and also a significant amount more borrowing. That could be down the road a problem for the markets. Now the one thing that neither candidate is addressing is the deficit, is federal spending. Both candidates would spend more and, uh, that not, and would not be able to make that up with additional revenue. If you just take a quick look at this chart, I won't dwell on the charts, but this is the federal deficit going forward. Since 2009, the deficit's been coming down. It was at an all-time high in 2009, and it's been coming very nicely down until this year when it's going back up and is gonna to continue to go back up. And the primary reason for that is the aging of the baby boomers. Social Security and Medicare spending is getting higher and higher as the baby boomers age. And again, if you look at the deficit, again, you can see going forward, it gets greater and greater. This is, by the way, the deficit. This is not the amount of U.S. debt outstanding. The deficit is the difference each year that the amount the government spends exceeds what it takes in. The total debt outstanding is you take that shortfall and add it to all the shortfalls for the prior years that we had to borrow for, and that brings us to $19 trillion of debt outstanding. Now, in the past, the way you could address the deficit was to reduce spending, what we call discretionary spending. At this point, though, 70% of all federal spending is what we call mandatory spending. It doesn't matter who the president is, this money has to go out every single year. And mandatory spending is entitlements, primarily Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and Obamacare payments, and interest on the national debt. That is now 70% of all spending. There's not enough in the other spending to cut it to set the deficit right. The only way to deal with this is entitlement reform, cutting down on Social Security and Medicare spending for younger people, not for people in their 50s and older, maybe not for people in their 40s, but younger people, maybe we push back the retirement age. Neither party is prepared to do that at this point. So what does that tell me and what does it mean for you? It means that I think Paul Ryan and the deficit hawks in the, white, in the uh, Congress, in the House, are gonna be on a constant search for revenue. They're going to keep looking for ways to bring in more tax revenue in the coming years. Now, when I say that, I don't mean higher tax rates. There's no way the Republicans want higher rates. I don't mean a major change like they get rid of uh, mortgage interest deduction or they take away tax exempt interest on bonds. That's not going to happen. The Republicans don't want that. When I say that there'll be a search for revenue, what I'm referring to is what we call loophole closures. These are provisions in the tax code that everybody can probably agree are too generous and should be cut back. Provisions that you may have been working with Randy on to use to maximize your returns. I'll give you a quick example, and I'm sorry to take you down a technical rabbit hole here, but last December, government had to be funded, spending was going up, 
And so Congress included a loophole closure. They took away a social security strategy called file and suspend, which was a neat strategy where a married couple could get extra social security benefits completely legally. That's gone. What you see up here, and I'm not going to drag you through this, are loophole closures that Congress has gone on to consider, and they're considering now. And I'll just explain one of them to you just to give you a feel of what goes on here. Under current law, if you have an IRA account and you pass away and, and your spouse also passes away, and so your account, say, goes to your kids, your kids can take a little bit out of that account, a little bit each year, over their life expectancy. That leaves the bulk of the amounts in the IRA over their lifetime, which continue to build up tax deferred. This is called stretching an IRA. That's an example where Congress says, no, no, no. Kids shouldn't be able to take that money out over time and keep the money in the IRA. When somebody dies and somebody inherits an account, everything should come out of the account, the IRA account immediately, and taxes should be paid on that. That's an example of a loophole closer. Now, I don't know if that gets passed versus other of these versus ones we don't know about. The thing for you to keep in mind here is, I believe we will see a whittling away of opportunities to save taxes. Some of the strategies you're working with Randy and his team on may go away as some of the ways that we save taxes go away as Congress is looking for revenue. Now, you're probably already thinking, gosh, taxes are already high. You know, what are we going to do about this? And you're right that the top tax rate went up 10 percentage points in 2013. That's an astronomical increase in a single year. And according to the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, current tax rates are well above the average rates during the past 35 years for households at the top of the income distribution. Affluent Americans are paying the highest taxes they've paid in almost four decades. And as I said, I think it will get worse as Congress is searching for nonpartisan ways to bring in a little more revenue over time. That's regardless of who wins the election. So, and this is my final point to you before we take questions. The key is going to be continuing to focus on minimizing the tax drag on your investments. All the things that you're doing with Randy, I know he does a lot of work with ETFs, very tax efficient, harvesting losses, buy and hold strategies and some other investments, muni bonds, perhaps REITs or master limited partnerships, things that flow through income with little or no tax. You also want to keep an eye on where you hold your tax inefficient investments. Some investments just throw off a lot of taxable income. That's the way it is. And that's okay, but if possible, hold those investments in your IRA account or in something like a variable annuity, which is a product that gives you tax deferral on your investments. The ability to defer tax on tax inefficient investments is very important. All right, before I open it up for questions, I'm gonna answer the one question I know you are dying to ask. And I'm gonna save you the trouble of jumping out of your seat here, it'll be embarrassing. The question I know you are dying to ask is, do I have a website? Yes, I do. <laughs> it's thewashingtonupdate.com. Uh, we have an email going out later this week uh, with a white paper talking about some of the things I talked to you tonight about, uh, and you're welcome to sign up there. Email alerts are free. So with that as background, we have time to take some questions, and I will repeat the question. Let's go. Yes, sir. All right, his question is, what about changing the step-up basis? So just a little, it's a great question. A little background here. I believe you know when you pass away, uh, and your assets go to your children or whoever they go to, uh, that, that, you're, that there is what's called a step up in basis, which means that the value of the asset on the date of death becomes the basis for your kids. So if I buy a stock for $10, and when I pass away, it's worth $100, my kids take that stock with $100, they only pay tax when they sell on amounts over $100. So that $90 of gain that existed during my lifetime, that's wiped out. Nobody ever pays tax on that. That's called stepped up basis and it's a big advantage because it lets kids or heirs not pay tax when they sell assets. And the short answer is no, there won't be any changes in that. And the reason is that stepped up basis is treated as 
uh, a quid pro quo for the estate tax. Since you have to pay estate tax when you die, it's not fair that your kids also have to pay capital gains tax when they sell the assets. Now, while the Republicans talk about getting rid of the estate tax, that's not going to happen. As long as we have an estate tax, we'll have stepped up basis. So I'm, that is not a concern I have. Other questions? No more coffee without questions, and I know you need it. So <laughs> let's go. Yes, we'll take both of you. We'll start with you. So what do you think is going to happen with Obamacare? What's going to happen with Obamacare? Um, you know, I don't want to, like, have a town hall meeting over this because this is a sensitive subject, particularly right now. It's a very good question. Uh, so let me just kind of quickly, again, step back, talk about what's happened and then what it, what it means. The way Obamacare works, you know all this, is that it provides insurance. It's a way of everybody having health insurance. And the idea was that people could go to these exchanges, these websites, and buy their insurance. And that there would be plenty of insurance companies that would offer their insurance to you on that website. The other way Obamacare works, and you know this, is you're guaranteed to get insurance. No matter how sick you've been, no matter what your medical problems are, if you've been sick, you still get insurance. And the insurance company can't charge you more than they would charge somebody who's healthy. That's, that's how Obamacare works. And that works only if you have a lot of healthy people signing up for insurance so the insurance companies can kind of leverage or smooth out the risk of the people who are sick buying insurance. The problem has been that healthy people have not been signing up, at least not in the numbers needed to, to, to defray the, the problem of covering sick people. Now, up until this year, that hasn't been that big a problem. And the reason is that Obamacare included what Republicans call a bailout, whereas if insurance companies lost money because of this whole system, the government would reimburse them. They would get their losses back. That bailout ended last year. So now all of a sudden insurance companies are looking at these losses and saying we don't want to participate in Obamacare anymore. And so what you've seen, and probably what you're alluding to correctly, is that we have seen companies saying, Edna just said it, UHS has said it, we're out of here. We're not going to participate in the exchanges. Well, that's a problem because if you only have one or two companies or maybe zero companies in the exchanges, then the whole system doesn't really work. So what happens? Well, I think some people would say that if the system falls down, if it bogs down, if we don't have insurance companies, do we use the federal government as an insurer of last resort? Do we end up, say, with a single payer system where the government, because private insurers aren't participating, the government has to take over uh, providing insurance? Now, we're not there. We're not there. Uh, but I think that is a risk. I think the concern is that if insurance companies can't make money on this system, if they can't cover sick people for the same price as healthy people, Obamacare can't work. And then what do you do? Uh, and that's when you have to wonder, does the federal government step in? Now, to be fair, that would require legislation. It would be hard to get that legislation through a Republican House. So I'm not saying that, you know, somebody snaps their fingers and we have a single payer system. But I think your question is the right one, which is, uh, if companies are leaving the system, how does Obamacare survive in its current form, and what do we get instead of it? Ma'am? That was my question. Oh, do you guys know each other? No. <laughs> <laughs> Should introduce yourselves. You obviously think alike. I like that. Other questions? Other questions? Don't be shy. What about uh, corporate tax rates? Okay, cor that's another great question. Corporate tax rates. Um, what, what we have right now in the United States is we have the highest corporate tax rate in the world, 35 percent. We also have a really strange, un, unique, I would say, provision in our tax law, which is as follows. If you're a U.S. corporation, I'm talking about corporations now, not people. If you're a U.S. corporation and you set up a company overseas to handle sales in that company, you know, Pepsi-Cola selling Pepsi in France, and you earn money on that, you don't pay any U.S. tax as long as the cash you earn stays overseas, in France, in my example. But if the company repatriates that cash back to the United States, then there's a 35% tax. We're the only country that does that. And so what's happened is U.S. companies are keeping all their cash overseas, trillions of dollars, rather than bring them back into the United States, because why pay that 35% tax? So there's, I think, something of a consensus in Washington that that should be changed, maybe permanently, maybe temporarily. At a minimum, we should have a repatriation holiday, which means companies can bring their money back to the U.S. 
and maybe we tax it at 5% or 10%. And that does a lot of good, right? It gets the money back here where we want it, and it actually brings in some revenue for the government because we're never going to get that 35%. They're never going to bring the money back. And I think, I think most people in Washington would say, yeah, that makes sense, both parties. The concern is, one, how do you use that money? So Republicans say, oh, that's that lower the taxes and, you know, lower the taxes, bring money back, have a low tax rate. That brings in a slug of money to the government and let's give it, you know, give it back in tax refunds, give it back to the people paying the tax. Democrats say, no, we should use that money for a government program to help people move up into the middle class. So the Obama's proposal is have a repatriation holiday with a low tax rate, bring the money back, get some tax revenue, spend it on a jobs program. There's not anywhere near agreement on that, and that makes it very difficult. There's another concern, this is a purely political one, individual tax reform, meaning that affects you and me, is exceedingly hard because it involves investigating the deductions like home mortgage interest or muni bond interest, and that's just a bridge too far. You can't deal with that. So how do politicians explain to people like you and me, we're lowering taxes on corporations but we're not lowering taxes on families. Now, while that's probably the right thing to do, you should have a repatriation holiday, it would do all of us a lot of good, that politically is really, really hard to sell. So while I think there's consensus to lower the corporate tax rate and allow the money to come back, those two concerns, do you spend the money or not? And how do you explain it to people whose taxes are already high and not going down? I think that's what's standing in the way. Other questions? Any others? Yes, sir. Yeah, his question is, what about simplifying taxes by going to a national sales tax or a value-added tax? Most economists think that that kind of tax, a consumption tax, where you tax what you spend rather than what you earn, makes tremendous sense. And they think it makes sense because it gets the underground economy. You remember, um, you remember uh, Mitt Romney, 47% of Americans don't pay, in pay income taxes? If you have a consumption tax, they would because this money that comes in that they're not paying taxes on, when they spend it, when they go buy groceries, there'll be a national sales tax on it, they'll have to pay tax. And so many people, many economists say that's what we need. We need a tax that captures all the families that aren't otherwise paying taxes. Probably because it makes so much sense, neither party wants it. <laughs> but for entirely different reasons. Democrats don't want a consumption tax or a sales tax because it's regressive. The middle class spends a higher portion of their income than the wealthy do. And so the Democrats say, we don't want to tax those people who are spending more of their income. We want to tax the wealthy, but we want to tax them on what they don't spend. How do we do that? Well, we have these new 3.8% taxes under Obamacare that tax wealthy people on their savings, on their earnings. So Democrats want to go the other way. They don't want to tax the middle class on what they spend. They want to tax the wealthy on what they save. Republicans, that's not their primary concern, but Republicans' concern are is that a consumption tax is a money machine. Once you set up a national sales tax system, Congress in any given year can raise it a quarter percent, a half a percent. Not much to us, but it brings a tremendous amount of money into the federal government. And so those two things together caused, they just had a recent uh, proposal in the Senate, a sense of the Senate resolution against a national sales tax, passed the Senate 82 to 13 or something like that. So while it makes sense, again, just like the corporate tax, I don't think it's going to happen. Why don't I take one more and then I'll hang around afterward with you. Yes, sir. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled that corporations are people and they can uh, vote as much as they want, spend as much as they want on politicians without discovery? Does that make sense? Uh, another great question. It's very smart clients, Randy. His question was about the Supreme Court uh, and its ruling in the Citizens United about corporations being able to have unlim unlimited amount of money they can spend on campaigns and on candidates. And you, you nailed the case. What the Supreme Court said was, well, let me back up again, I'm sorry, but there can't be limits on what you can spend of your own money on candidates. As individuals, you have a right of free speech. You can spend as much money as you want on lawn signs or dinners or whatever you want to support a candidate. Nobody can stop you from doing that. 
The thought was, though, that corporations didn't have a right of free speech and that Congress, which they did, could pass a law that would limit what corporations can spend on campaigns. And corporations include, by the way, PACs. Those are corporations. Uh, and I will give Congress credit in this case. It was a bipartisan law, campaign finance reform, that really would have cut down on corporations being able to influence elections. The Supreme Court said, and who knew this, uh, that corporations have the same right of free speech that you have. Uh, and because they have a right of free speech, nobody can limit what they can spend on elections. And that upset an awful lot of people on both sides of the aisle. Uh, and I, do I think it's right? No, I don't think it's right. I, I think that's news to a lot of people that corporations have this right of free speech. Uh, but right now it's the law of the land, and I don't know how Congress can get around that, and that leaves us with the PAC system and this view that, that uh, you know, politics is all tawdry uh, because of that. You know, since you raised the Supreme Court, maybe you'll indulge me for a second and uh, also let me talk a little bit about the Supreme Court uh, and the Republicans not, uh, not considering Merrick Garland. Uh, and, you know, I try to play all this right down the middle. Uh, but, uh, but as a substantive matter, we'll talk about the political implications in a second. As a substantive matter, I think the Republicans may have shut themselves in the foot here. And I, I said that right as soon as McConnell, Scalia died and McConnell said we're not going to take up the nominee. Because you have a Republican Senate right now, any nominee has to go through the Republicans. And that meant that Obama had to nominate somebody pretty moderate. And Merrick Garland is pretty moderate. He's kind of your technical jurist who looks at a case and decides what he thinks the right thing to do is. Maybe he leans a little left. He's pretty much in the center. And my concern is, if you're a Republican, that by not considering him uh, and then say the election goes the way it's likely to go, which is that Clinton wins, maybe that doesn't happen, but Clinton wins, and she's going to not, I think, put on Merrick Garland, I think Clinton is going to nominate people that are much further left. And the reason is she's going to have a Democratic Senate, in my analysis. She doesn't have to tippy-toe around the Republicans as much as Obama has had to. If you're a Republican, the reason that I think you want the Supreme Court is because of the, uh, un the, the extensive use of executive order. Many people feel that Obama has done an end run around Congress by doing a lot by executive order. And the only check on executive order is the Supreme Court or is the court system. I mean, Congress could pass something saying the president can't do that, but the president is just going to veto it. You're not going to get anywhere. And if you look at the court system, they have been knocking down a lot of Obama's orders. His immigration uh, uh, regs, his environmental regs, all have been knocked down by the courts. If you get a Supreme Court with, that is stacked with more left-leaning justices in a Hillary Clinton presidency, there won't be any checks on her ability to use executive order. And so I think the Republicans would have been much better served to put Garland on the court or at least hold hearings to see if he's worthy of being on the court rather than open the door for what may be uh, 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 people put up who maybe wouldn't put as much of a check on what Clinton would do. Now, politically, I know this is a big issue. Uh, why haven't the Republicans taken it up? But for many of the independents, remember, just on the independents, I'm not sure it's that big an issue. And that's because, again, independents worry more about economic issues than social issues. The Supreme Court deals more with social issues, like gay marriage uh, or abortion. And again, I think the people that are registered in the parties tend to, to care more about that than independents. So I'm not sure this is that big of a deal as a political matter, that they haven't taken up the Garland nomination. But I do wonder if the Republicans haven't shot themselves in the foot there a little bit. All right, I'm going to stop here, but hang around with you afterward. I'll turn it back to Randy. Thank you guys for coming out. I appreciate it. Okay. I want to thank Andy, obviously. Thank all of you for coming. Uh, thank Ian Roche. I think he's still here from Oppenheimer. Mike Mattoni uh, from Crossroads. And Andrew Dickin, who really helped set this up, as well as the whole team from my office. The next big event we're doing uh, is in November, I believe it's November 11th. We're going to do a town hall type meeting. It's the first time we've ever done that. Uh, basically just taking questions on asset protection, taxes, that type of thing. And then we have a lot of other stuff coming up. Take a look at the website uh, or check the client memo, the hard copy. And uh, as always, if you have questions, just give us a call. So thank you. Thank you.